I developed a project called Samudra. And San, uh, Samudra is this, the, the first word for water. It's a Sanskrit term. It literally means to gather together the waters. And I have a vision that I, I'm going to connect the entire ocean. What Elon Musk did for satellites in Starlink, and uh, people might have bad taste in their mouth for Elon, but uh, what he did with Starlink, I want to do around the ocean and connect every uh, industry, every economy around the ocean to collaborate and uh, use information in a way that's never been done before. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where I meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gosberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast listeners, and welcome to episode 207. Back in November, when the news about the discontinuation of trade lens, a blockchain-enabled global trade platform was announced, many of my friends involved with digitalization and logistics started discussing blockchain's pros and cons. Naturally, I was leaning heavily towards the morning of the loss of trade lands, but I could also see many people analyzing the reasons behind the closing. These discussions introduced me to Matthew Schwab, captain, CEO and subject matter expert. He's a former master mariner who has gone ashore and is using all the skills he learned from his time at sea to make the change we as an industry so necessary need. This is my conversation with Matthew Schwab, captain, CEO and subject matter expert. I hope you will enjoy it. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Captain Matthew Schwab. I've been a merchant marine officer and captain since 2002 and uh, currently reside in Florida. I left the merchant marine in uh, 2020 to uh, kind of fulfill a higher purpose and look forward to diving into this with you, Lena. And uh, personally, I love surfing and spending time with my fiance and our, uh, our cats in Florida. And what is your background? How did you come in contact with the maritime world? My father told me that due to my, my Scorpio personality that uh, I created influence with people that if I went to a normal college, I probably would have convinced 50 people to party our way out and we all would have been laughing as we got expelled. So he said it was either the military or a, um, a military type school. So I ended up going to the Merchant Marine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you are the type of the guy who's uh, doing what your parents are telling you. That's funny. That's uh, that's that's part of the part of the story, and that's where the the path separated in 2020. Uh, so, short story, in the in the beginning, yes, it, it was. It was, you know, I was fulfilling kind of the the dream my my parents wanted for me, and didn't really understand what it meant to really live my own life. So, I confronted some obstacles in the merchant marine that few people would encounter. I've had uh, worked with the military and I remember I was had a fire. I was chief mate and I had a fire off the East coast of Africa in the middle of the night and 125 people were on board and we had $90 million of the Navy's ammunition in the holds. So, you know, that'll put a pretty big hole in the ocean. I did that for 10 years working with the military and saw the world, developed a huge love for people, a huge love for culture and community. And I found I took that with me every ship that I went to. And it's not it's not egoic, but I would get emails from people when I left and they would say, you know, the, the ship's just not the same without you. Like it was a you know it was a family type atmosphere. And I honestly think that was kind of something that I, I really wanted to to fill just the way that my family communicated growing up. You know, we're always trying to fill the gaps that, that we didn't have. So my parents afforded me a great opportunity to go into the merchant marine, but it was while that was kind of where they saw me capping out through my, my whole life, I always saw it as just being a stepping stone. I just didn't know where it was going to go. And that took me into uh, from, you know, sailing with the military and military sea lift command, getting my captain's license at the age of 30, and then uh, transitioning over to oil and gas because I wanted a quote unquote more stable life. It was anything but, you know, I was... <laughs> So I worked in oil and gas as a captain 
Uh, it was my first captain's job. It was something so otherworldly because it was a, a company that they didn't have any permanent captains on board up until that point. Uh, it was the after the Macondo moratorium in the in the Gulf of Mexico, they decided to put uh, take rental captains off and you know put a permanent captain on there. So I was sailing side by side a, a offshore installation manager or OIM that was you know my father's age and his son was my age. I'm sitting here a captain, his equal, he's from Alabama and uh, his son just got his third mate's license. So he's this man who's been doing this longer than I've been alive, had all of a sudden take orders from yeah. someone of his son's age. And that was a, that was a huge challenge for me. Huge. Uh, three years. I, I endured that and I developed a, an, an enormous amount of patience doing so. I can imagine. Yeah, it was in. It was intense. But uh, again, th those are the greatest lessons we learned in life. And I saw this common thread. And I know you've had other uh, other guests talk about culture on, on the shipping podcast here. And by the way, congratulations. Seven years <laughs> you've been doing this. That's amazing to, Thank you. to have that, that type of longevity. So, yeah. I um, am stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> Lena, Lena Gull, it's a Powerful name. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's, yeah. I, I learned so much from all the people I talked to. Yep. We, uh, that's another, something else that I took from the Merchant Marine was to be a lifelong learner. And there's a lot more power, power in listening than, um, than talking. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how, how life's journey kind of takes you. If I told you I was going to be where I am now five years ago, I said, you're crazy. Mm. No way. I do, I do have a lot of young people, students listening to this podcast. So that is why I'm interested in knowing your career and knowing what you've been doing up until now, because you shouldn't know. I mean, we know that you don't get into the place you're planning to become. I mean, nothing happens like you think it should happen. Never. And also, you don't get to be the managing director day one. Yeah, I, I remember developing all these intricate plans for cargo discharge. And the minute you put all this time and effort to, into it, and the minute you hit the go button, it's like everything just goes to it, it just goes out the window. And you just gotta you gotta roll with it and you gotta you gotta adapt, adapt and be fluid. So I'm glad to hear that you have a lot of younger people uh listening to this because that that's a, a great a great target audience because what I what I took from the merchant marine, I I, I went on a, an amazing I guess we're all on it, but uh, an amazing spiritual journey starting in 2013 when I left uh, military seal of command and transitioned over to the oil and gas industry, which I kind of turned the term, the inner voyage. And it was so, it's such a journey of self-awareness, observation of your emotions, your, your mindset, constantly observing your thoughts. That's like the, one of the most challenging things that you can do in life. And there's such expectation from social media and jobs and schools now for the young people to perform that it's it's mind-boggling you know and you you have to come back to that and understand who you are you are not those people that that on social media that has a million followers that's not you you're the observer of that all of all those experiences and maybe maybe we just lost the baby boomer generation but that's fine in this conversation <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's it's really a journey of self awareness and of consciousness, it's observing like what is happening to you in that moment, and are you are you living your life in a way that is being governed by somebody else, and you're just a label or an identity? That was something very challenging that I had to overcome. Was when I left the Merchant Marine sailing. I'm, I'm still a captain, but uh, when I left the Merchant Marine in 2020, like right in the middle of COVID the hardest thing that I had to get over was, okay, I'm not Captain Matthew anymore. What am I? Who am I? What What does this all mean? <laughs> so really flushing that out. And I thought that I, I confronted a lot of my fears when I was, when I was sailing. Nope. They were all waiting for me. Everything. Like I traveled the world trying, I guess, to get away from them, but understanding your emotions, why, why they're there, uh, what, what they're there to teach you because they're an amazing teacher, feelings and emotions. And then how that ties into mindset and how that helps you govern your, your day-to-day -day life. 
because as we know, COVID shifted everything for everybody. And it's either you want to look at yourself and find out why you do the things you do, or you're just going to continue to be an ostrich and stick your head in the sand and just watch this huge wave of change wash over you. And what I mean by wave of change is I think there's a huge correlation between self-awareness and technology. And as you become more self-aware of your movements, your thoughts, your beliefs, your feelings, your actions, and how they all tie in, that creates greater opportunity within innovation. May I ask how old were you when you left the Merchant Marine? Because that might be something connected there. Uh, I was um, I was 40, 41, mm. 40, almost three years ago. Could be an early middle-aged life crisis as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. But there was a there was also a uh, an understanding that I was always I feel like I think like I was always called to do more, and I was always kind of pushing innovation wherever I was at, and then felt stifled like I hit this glass ceiling in the Merchant Marine. You know, oh, we could do this differently, or we could do this differently. No, maybe we want to stick stick to the tradition and just you know keep keep the lights on and what works. So when I left the Merchant Marine, I was like, okay, like the hardest thing somebody could do in life is find out who they are and where they fit in with everything. So I took that, I took that knowledge of self-awareness and leadership and uh, my ability to create community and culture on ships and applied that to a coaching and consulting company, you know, business consulting and business development and personal performance, leadership, all of that. And as I was doing that, I started to learn about what blockchain technology was and how that can impact the future and how that can impact the merchant marine. So I just inundate my, inundated myself with books and meditation. And I got to a point where I was, I kind of did this when I was on the ships too. I would I'd listen to an audio book at like three X speed and set an intention before I, I believe strongly in intention, set an intention before I started the book that I'm going to absorb everything absolutely that I needed to in, in the first go. And I just sit there and I just let it, just pour over me and you know get a book done in the third of the time. It's a pretty good statistic. Yeah, I just started to learn about blockchain technology and then looked at looked at a lot of where we came from in terms of web two, if we if we will, the internet where the masses are kind of in right now. And what worked and what didn't. And things like the power of network effect. You know, we saw how information became more valuable than oil in 2017 that says something. Yeah. So how can we use the, where the social media platforms went wrong to benefit everybody? Because the true power of blockchain technology lies in the fact that it, it can is, exist in a zero trust environment and it's immutable and it's an immutable way to verify and, and validate all the information that you have within your company, your, your life, your ecosystem, and you own the information. You skipped a step there in between, I think, because maybe mm -hmm. you were a little bit interested in digitalization before <laughs> blockchain. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I work a lot with an association here in Gothenburg working with broadband, mm -hmm. which is the infrastructure for all connectivity on land. And I thought, yep. this is going to happen at sea as well. I better understand that. Yep. So... I have been listening to so many people because here in Gothenburg, we have all the different car manufacturers, software engineers, they are here. And they say that we have more engineers per square meter here than in Silicon Valley when it comes to automotive industry, which is interesting. Wow. And we also got head office for development of 5G for Ericsson globally here in Gothenburg. Mm -hmm. So I get to listen to them all. It's so fascinating. And that is where I got the interest of this is going to revolutionize the maritime industry. Yep. So I learned that before I learned about blockchain. <laughs> and it's it's great, but the thing with the thing the thing with digitalization and technology in general is mariners are so adverse to it. Well, it depends on depends on the generation. Yes. The baby boomers, adverse for the most part, at least 70% of them, Gen X, Gen Y, 
a little more adaptive. We're the I'm I'm that micro generation where it's it's between Gen X and the baby boomers. Yeah. Uh, so I, I believe that my age group has a and yours like from from you to me is a very very vital age range because we come we have that one foot in the analog world and we're the last generation to have that everybody else knows technology knows smartphones so i believe we have a very powerful purpose in making sure that human element connection remains intact yeah and taking what true culture is not something that is just checking off boxes like a lot of the companies are doing now to fill it with to fill a cultural position with the angriest person in the company it's not really it's kind of kind of counteractive but um i mean technology is coming whether people like it or not so it's it's how do we learn to interact with it and that's that's another beauty about blockchain is that we own all of this information it just comes down to how what type of governance do we put to it and how do we relate with that information back and forth because there's things going on on shipping. I mean, you, you know, uh, from Ocean Bird, wind powered sails to what Wallanus Wilhelmsen is doing within their ecosystem to the Yara Birkeland, which is, you know, AI driven container ship to autonomous ferries to the sustainability projects that are just crazy to trade lens, which, you know, shut its doors. And we talked a little bit about that before. There's so much happening uh, with AI as well, where AI is helping the mariner make better decisions but ultimately when if something happens where does the onus fall where does the liability yep. fall it's not on the ai it's on the captain so it's really how we're learning to interact with this information and i think that's very very important to to move forward in i post an article every now and again that this fourth industrial revolution that we're in right now that morals ethics and philosophy will play the biggest role that it ever has been or ever has, and it's true. Yeah, and we have to, as I understand it, regulations and law is following. Mm -hmm. They are not as far ahead as we are, or as technology is, I mean. Right. So, and, and, and I mean, that is also, how do we want those regulations to be? Which is also a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. There's so much happening right now, and it doesn't help that the massive population's first introduction to web three and blockchain technology it was a jpeg that was worth you know nothing that they two days ago and, and all of a sudden it's worth like millions of dollars <laughs> and then we see things in the in the crypto world uh with you know ftx and, and this and that and maybe we should talk a little bit about this because maybe my listeners are not as familiar as you are let's go let's let's start from nft that's, that's a good idea so nfts non-fungible tokens are pretty much JPEGs or a, a GIF file that all of a sudden had an immense amount of value coming in or in the middle of the pandemic. I'm, I'm sure people have heard of Board Ape Yacht Club, CryptoPunks. Uh, they're just JPEGs that have a what's called a smart contract attached to it. And the picture itself is worthless, but the, the technology that's what's called a smart contract, which when you purchase a non-fungible token through your digital wallet, uh, MetaMask or Solana or Phantom, whatever, whatever you have, that will connect your cryptocurrency or digital asset to that NFT. And then you now own that NFT. And what's beautiful about it is that you can sell or resell that NFT and you will every time that it is sold after you sell it, you are attached to that smart contract. So you will get residual income or, or passive income from the sale of that NFT. So it, it creates a community and uh, a revenue stream for people in perpetuity. And it's an absolute amazing technology, but I think the masses have, have gotten a bad taste in their mouth because they just hear what the mainstream media says about them. But if you scratch beneath the surface a little bit and try and understand what the premise of this technology is really trying to show us is it's astounding. It's the it's the blockchain or the digital ledger technology movement that is uh, that is governing all this. It's not NFTs. It's not crypto. It's not a Web three company. It's it's none of that. It's the technology behind it. The ability to connect people and create culture around a belief system that we have. If you love 
If you love flowers, you can create a Web3 community around flowers. If you love yachting, there's a, a company out of Miami, Phantom Yacht Club. They have a consortium of yachts and they have an NFT. And if you want to rent these yachts, then you need to own the NFT and you can have access to these yachts around the world. Miami, Portugal, I think they have some in. And it's absolutely amazing. It brings together like-minded people in a way using technology that has never, ever been done before. And it's simple and it's it's immutable. It is a technology that is able to exist in a zero trust environment, which is where we're moving to. Uh, nobody trusts anybody anymore, especially after you know how Web2 or the tech companies have used our information. It was a blessing and a curse, and that's fine. But Web3 and blockchain technology can uh, help you own all of your information and benefit from it in perpetuity. And it's it's simple, but it's absolutely amazing. Can you explain Web3? Web3 is the, the evolution of the internet. Right now, it's everything is server-based. So all the information feeds from you to a server, the server i.e. Amazon, Google, Facebook, Net, whatever, they own the information. Within Web3, it is, it is what's called decentralized. So there are bits and fragments, pieces of information that flow around this ecosystem web of computers that is uh, either encrypted or open ledger. And it will it's able to transfer that information much more quickly because everybody owns a piece of it. And it's, it's called decentralization. So where everything was server-based prior, now it's more ecosystem-based. Do the leaders of our industry understand this? Because it's, it makes a change for every level of, you know, what we are doing. I developed a project called Samudra. And San Samudra is the, the, the first word for water. It's a Sanskrit term. It literally means to gather together the waters. And I have a vision that I, I'm going to connect the entire ocean. What Elon Musk did for satellites and Starlink, and uh, people might have bad taste in their mouth for Elon, but uh, what he did with Starlink, I want to do around the ocean and connect every uh, industry, every economy around the ocean to collaborate and uh, use information in a way that's never been done before. And it's through using, essentially through using network effect that social media develop. So how do we get industries to adopt? One, education. Two, culture. It all comes back to culture. And what is culture? Culture is nothing but a relationship. So if we're having conversations with the, with the right people around relationships and information, and we're shifting the conversation because there's a lot of fear around information. There's a lot of information hoarding. So if we're able to shift that conversation from one of fear to one of community and prosperity for everyone, and then layer on top of that, the fact that we can use a blockchain in a, a public ledger or an open source form, a consortium form, which is a balance between a private and a uh, open a public ledger, or we can do a totally private and have our blockchain be... Um, solely for us. And then the beauty about that is if once it's private, we can, we get more comfortable with it. We can open it up to more of an open source, uh, open source platform. So I think it's just time. I mean, you know, people, people said that when we came off the gold standard, that the fiat system was going to fail and look where it got us. And now, and then, then they said the internet, oh, there's, that's going to fail. The internet's a fad. Look where we are now. People say credit cards were going to fail. Look where we are now. And it's just, uh, we're at, right now, we're literally, in terms of blockchain, we're, we're about like 1993. Mm. We're Google and everybody was kind of battling. My experience through these seven years of interviewing people and, and listening, you know, I understand that digitalization came into the maritime industry first as something, well, that might be for everyone else, but not for us. And then after a while, they realized, okay, maybe there is something here that I need to know. Okay, let's, let's hire a few consultants. So a few consultants came into their industry and started doing small things and digitizing things, I think. And then after a while, maybe some of the leaders realized, yeah, I think this is something we need to do. So they started to buy startups and put them into their own companies mm -hmm. 
and learning from them. But they were an isolated little island, so they didn't have that much impact. Nowadays, the shipping companies and, and all the maritime industry companies are hiring their own digital wizards into their company because they know they know they need to change. But this has taken 10 years. And it has been interesting to watch all this different because at the beginning, all, I interviewed consultants and they were earning so much money. <laughs> so they had their golden age. Then for a while, the startups, the people from maybe the outside and some people who had left the big companies and started a startup from within the maritime industry, but mostly the startups were from the digital world. And then they were having a golden age. So who will be having the next golden age here? Because it's all about the money at the end of the day. Yeah. It's the bottom line. It is. And who, who gets at this first will start the conversation and lead the conversation. Yeah. Trade Lens, it was is an was an amazing platform, but it lacked it lacked culture. And it came out, it was a it was a web two or a web three idea that was built on a web two framework and theory. And I, I think it was just a little too early if they developed it now and had the proper culture and community backing them because they, they got a bunch of giants and it was amazing in theory. And I wish, I wish they, we had a conversation with the gentleman that you introduced us and, you know, it was about culture. If they had the culture in place and they had buy-in from people, that it would probably be a completely different story right now. What do you mean with culture? Uh, having having a community that is able to um, speak to the power of the platform of the trade lens platform that speaks for that speaks for the platform and um, is is connected through something like an NFT or or a token. I think if they had gone that route, then they would have had had mass adoption a lot quicker. Do people understand that that is why it failed, or will we? forever block blockchain in the maritime industry i i don't think so i think it uh because there's the, the way the way i'm structuring this it's using the information that's there already as a flywheel to generate greater income or great other revenue streams expand ecosystems own the information that, that they have and then be able to expand that as uh, a totally another revenue stream i was uh was starting to write down I had a coach that I was working with and he said, write down 200 things that, that your your company will help people do. And you get to like number 50 and you're like, holy cow. I mean, there's there's a lot that you can do with this from helping to eradicate human trafficking through shipping containers, which everybody is aware of, shipping companies included, government included. Uh, and we want to, we're, we're, we're starting to scratch the surface on, on helping it along, but uh, it's a monster that exists that, needs to have more light shined on it. We can help culture, like small cultural towns that uh, I know there's a lot in Florida here that are decimated by storms every every year. And if we're having this ecosystem that is running on the information that already exists on the ships, a ship is an, is an IoT. People don't realize it. A thing moving through the ocean is an IoT. The containers are an IoT. That is hard information that is worth more than oil. And that is that's the, that's the infrastructure that needs to be tapped into. That's that's the logistics side, and then you can connect and connect that into environmental and sustainability, and then just expand out from there. We're having a conversation with a pretty big ship shipping group owner operator, and once once you tap into that and you get the understanding from a major shipping company, I think it's game over because people want an answer. People want something that is going to help offset you know, decarbonization, or even if it's just, even if it's just something financial right now that you can use to buy carbon credits for your, for your company to offset decarbonization, uh, or creating a fund that will help your company solve decarbonization or biofouling or underwater noise, whatever, have, whatever the environmental issue is that you're, you're working on right now. There's information within your company that, that is so powerful. That nobody's tapping into it. We are. Like I, I know, I, I know that why my what my purpose was in sailing for twenty years and observing every industry that I was in. I'm like, 
okay, I see how this company's using information. I see how they're using information. It's not connected. It, it waterfalls down, waterfalls from the, you know, the, the space industry to the aeronautical industry to the oil and gas drilling, and then down to the shipping industry. And they take it from the oil companies, but it can be, it can move a lot faster. Once people understand, Lena, that you can create greater competition through greater collaboration, that's the end game. Hooray! Because you, Some, yeah, someone know, right? said I mean, it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a pie, it's a pie in the sky idea, but it's really simple. Like you look at a you look at some of the the the, the DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations that are out there right now, and they're massive ecosystems, completely self sustaining. The only other shipping company, Marisk, is trying to do it. While Anus is trying to do it, they're doing a great job at it. But there's going to get to a point, just as as in we adopted digitalization, where these closed ecosystems are going to have to connect. They have to. Like everybody's everybody's running to, to like you know lead the ocean, lead the ocean economy. Well, there's another thing beyond that called the new blue economy. <laughs> and yeah. It just has to do with sustainability and information, and it'll just keep going. So it's just a matter of time before these like huge shipping ecosystems are going to have to play in the sandbox together. Yeah. Or the title pool or whatever, whatever the label. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting because I've been asking my guests about where are the unexpected collaborations and no one really, because I mean, what I thought was unexpected collaboration was that in Sweden, I can order food to be delivered to the, to my car when I'm at work because the food delivery company has the ability to open my boot and put my Mm -hmm. grocery in there and go away again. That is unexpected for me, but it's so beneficial for me as a person because my food is in my car. So I just go home with, and you know, preparing it. Yep. That was unexpected to me. What we still are doing in this industry is, we are collaborating as a ship owner with the port. Yeah, that's not unexpected because you have to. <laughs> so I am just looking for the unexpected collaborations, which will set some more minds flipping. <laughs> I have some unexpected collaborations uh, up my sleeve, I assure you. <laughs> good, very yeah. good, very good. I'm looking Ordering. forward to that. Yeah, it, it, uh, I remember I listened to the... Uh, the Ocean Bird podcast you guys did a couple episodes ago, and you had mentioned that uh, you know you did it that that episode, another episode with uh, the gentleman what was it two years ago, three years ago, and I was like, yeah, that's going to be cool. Like three years from now, we circle back around and oh, where are we at? Oh, okay. Remember we we're talking about collaboration? It's happening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very very powerful, and and it's it's all sitting it's all sitting right beneath everybody's nose. And they don't even see it. It's no. just hidden in plain sight. Why is that? Why is that? Is is our industry different in that way? Because we preach, we preach getting out of the way, not being, not becoming complacent. Mm. But I think that preaching creates a pendulum that makes us complacent. Mm. Look at take 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 the El Faro for example. What kind of proactive finding was found in the NT, NTSB reports? Something proactive that will change the industry. I'm holding up a big goose egg. And that's that's actually my use case. One of my use cases is how do we how do we create a platform where we can where everybody involved in a ship's movement, Department of Transportation, Coast Guard, I'm thinking on the U.S. side, Coast Guard, EPA, the port, the ship owner, the cargo owner, the the stevedores, the different the various um, divisions of the company that is uh, that's moving the ship, financial department, HR department. If everybody is looking at the same platform in real time of the ship's movement and overlaying weather data on it and seeing the day rate that that that, that, that is costing the, the the company per hour albeit we have different levels of security of, of who's going to view this information how easy can we make a decision on when to turn the ship around if it's going to head into a hurricane or if it's going to be in peril or it's going to hit uh, have some other type of emergency or if somebody's sick how fast can we how fast can we coordinate search and rescue efforts I was on a ship in 2017. I was chief mate. We were uh, we were floating out in the middle of, I guess this could be another use case. We were floating out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico because the 
company and the client split the contract and they couldn't make up their mind of which port we wanted to visit. So they set us directly halfway between Houston Ship Channel and Mississippi River. We sat there for three weeks, Memorial Day weekend. We had the the crew's relief, the captain's relief, the chief engineer's relief, my relief. Uh, I was the relief for the chief mate. And, you know, people had uh, parties to go to. I think one of the other captains had a daughter that was going to be born. And we're all just sitting out here floating. We saw a Russian bulker that was like 12 miles off our starboard bow. Russian captain comes over the, the VHF and he's just absolute chaos on the ship. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Somebody, you know, crew member just jumped overboard. It was like 85 degrees, flat, calm water. This guy gets naked and jumps overboard. He had enough. Six foot two, 250 pound Russian, Russian man. So we liaised with the Coast Guard and we went over there and provided some some assistance and put our fast rescue boat in the water. They put their lifeboat in the water. We followed this guy around the Gulf of Mexico for 10 hours. Swam for he swam for 10 hours. And because it was Memorial Day weekend, the Coast Guard couldn't couldn't activate fast enough. So it took him 10 hours to get on scene. By that time, the guy had decided to get back on the in his lifeboat and get back on the ship because he was just like burnt to a crisp. And there was some interesting things that happened. Like he got chased by a shark twice, <laughs> got, got on his lifeboat. <laughs> And then the shark left. He jumped back off the lifeboat. Shark came back. He got back on the lifeboat. <laughs> shark left. He jumped back in the water. Yeah, it's crazy. I shouldn't be so, laughing. No, no, no. Yeah. But it's like it's like those those moments of just like complete chaos. I do the same thing. I if I'm in a, a, a major emergency that I, I I I'm the one to inject some levity because it's just like it just gets to be so much. But um, you know, if if there was a platform where everybody was looking at that, looking at this, like Okay, here's here's this ship. Here's here's this ship. We just pull up another screen. How fast could we have mitigated that? How fast could we have solved the the Marisk, Alabama? I mean, that was pretty well expedited. I know that the gentleman who coordinated the uh, a good friend of mine, he coordinated the effort in, in Norfolk with with all that with SEAL teams and just amazing. But you know, how much more efficient can we get in in search and rescue and saving lives and moving cargo and then having the cargo be the information that powers the entire system, like? We have a global supply chain. You can use the information from that to power the entire the entire global supply chain. It creates a self generating ecosystem, mm -hmm. and that's 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 what we're working on. So it's um, it's the future. It's the future. I will introduce you to a friend of mine or a couple of friends of mine. And um, have you looked into maritime informatics? I have not. Dot org. I think you should. Because um, yeah, there was a there was a research uh, project here in Sweden where this it started with doing a port call where everyone is exchanging the information they have got to make that port call more efficient. Yep. And and nowadays it's even something you can learn at school when you are studying at university. Oh wow, good. And they are writing books, and uh, I think. You will probably love knowing those guys. <laughs> uh, and and um, Michael Lind is leading that project. And uh, he is uh, traveling the world to spread the gospel that you want to spread to the rest of the world. I will introduce you to him. Yeah, that's exciting. Yes, it is. What, what, what this is, is just, it's so simple. It's so simple. And it will literally solve everything. I, I know it sounds crazy, but when you think about it, if you can create a self-generating cash machine using the information that you already have while those ships are moving, you can offset you can offset global supply chain issues. You can offset uh, port delays. You can offset decarbonization. Purchase carbon tokens. Make yourself make your company carbon neutral. Carbon, whatever. Until we get to a point where that regenerative machine gets us past that inflection point. And it's like, oh, now we can, now we can grow our ecosystem. The problems are taken care of. Let's so, say, you know, it's like, it's like having a savings, savings account. Like, oh, let's get six months of, you know, emergency funds in case we have port delays. But I'm coming back to the question, do the leaders understand what you're talking about? Or is it the digital people who are, who's coming from the outside that knows more about this? That's why there's people like me, because I can speak to both sides. I can, you, you want to jump into the analog world? All right, let's talk about that. You want to jump into the digital world? Let's talk about that. 
You want to talk about the maritime world? Which part, which industry, which facet? Military, union, private, oil and gas. Let's talk about it because it's, it's, it's communication. Yeah. That is the communication and fear. That is the only thing holding people back. Because once you, once you transcend that, that veil of fear, you're like, oh my God, how did I not see this before? Mm. That's where it ties back to, to self-awareness and personal development and an understanding of yourself. Mm. Because if we want to be the change that we want to see, we need to first change ourselves. And you want to be, you're, you're, the, you're the person that is the voice for creating change in the maritime industry. Mm. And I love the fact that you're a woman doing it. <laughs> love it. Thank you. And that I'm not 25, but a little bit over 60. <laughs> That's fantastic. And, and for those of you who, who can't see, Lena does not look a day over 50. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Oh. So, yeah, it's, it is communication. And the reason why I tell stories is not to just sit here and t- say the things that I've done. It's to create relevancy. It's to create understanding and it's to create that, to create that emotional bond. People want to feel things. They want to under they want to understand it and they want to feel it. But the things that have happened in the political and the social landscape over the past five years has forced either forced people back into their shell or, or made them transcend their fears. Mm-hmm. So we're at this 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 inflection point where it's polarized. Yeah. Definitely. You're holding on to this information that you have and the servers that you're storing it on, if you're storing it with through like AWS or Google or whatever have you, do you realize they're making money off of that? No. Okay. Let's talk about that. Why are you, why are you holding on to this information with this death grip? Oh, because it's, it'll, um, if it gets out, it'll, it'll ruin our trade secrets. Okay. So what, what if it helps another company along and creates an opportunity for you that you had no idea that it was going to do? I can give you 10 examples in my life where, where, where that has happened. Some of financial, some of them not. But I want, yeah, I want to be the devil's advocate anyhow. Yeah. I agree yeah. with you, but I want to be that. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. The average ship owner owns 10 ships. Mm-hmm. I think if we get them on board, this way of thinking, then we can change the world. How do we get them on board? Here's how you do it. You get one company that is that does everything in-house, nearly everything. That almost has a closed closed ecosystem, but they haven't transcended into blockchain yet. You introduce them the possibilities of blockchain and get them on board and you have you do it and we're working on it right now. It's it's through a relationship of of a good friend of mine. You have that relationship that gets you in the door. We start talking, we start seeing where you're at. And it's like, okay, we can apply blockchain here, 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 and here. It makes sense. Oh wow. Okay. How are we going to make money? We'll do it this, 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 this. Okay, fair enough. Then we do, then we create an incubator within that company and bring those smaller ships on and create partnerships with the 10, 10 ship companies. From my experience, I think that those guys who are the average ship owner, who has the smaller ones, mm-hmm. they are the entrepreneurs, they are the brave ones, yep. but they are the most conservative ones, in my view. Well, that's that's the that's the thing is, that, and that's 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 awesome. But the information that we're using to start this isn't classified. It's all open source. You need two APIs to start this. If you talk to them today, I'm not sure even sure they know what an API is. This is you and me talking. I would use different language. Okay. Because if you get if you get a champion a, a champion a company to champion the idea, right? You have one company to champion the idea, and we're nearly there. One company to champion that idea, create the model, they can absorb that some of that risk. And you create that model, and then you show the smaller company, look what this bigger company is doing, and you can be connected to this, and here's how, how you can benefit from it. Ten ways. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Tell me a little more. Let me talk, let me talk. Just creating a relationship. Mm. I hope you're right. <laughs> me too. I think it's one generation away. Uh, one generation away. Of ship owners. Oh, so you're saying 20 years? No. Okay, half a generation. <laughs> All right, so 10 years. Yeah, mass adoption, mass adoption, 10 years. Yep. Because, I mean, it's still, it's still like it used to be in the old days that you were the captain of the ship mm-hmm. and you went ashore and you started your own company. 
and you started to hire the people that you had sailed with because then you were still the captain. Mm -hmm. And it's the culture from that hierarchy that is still also on shore. We're moving away from it, but it's still there, at least when it comes to the average size ship owners. It's not that way with the big ones. The big ones have, they have different ways to do things than the smaller ones, but I can see it. It's still there. It's like, I am the captain, do what I say. And they are not as brave as you say that we need to be when it comes to looking into yourself. And that's where, that, that's where you need to have somebody who's gone through that, that understands it. And that's, that's also some of the, a lot of the work that I do. And I, I saw it at a, now I see it at a, I was doing it at an early age. I was just unaware of it. So if there's those people that, you know, I'd, I'd love to help because it's really hard to do alone. But when you do it, it's, it's transformational. I remember when I left the shipping industry, I didn't know, I didn't know anything. All I remember is listening to podcasts and I was like, wow, that's, that'd be so cool to be on a podcast, especially about like talking about changing the industry or pushing the, pushing the ed- edge of innovation in the way that I've always, I've always seen that, that it could be done. Huh. Two and a half years later, here we are talking on that podcast. <laughs> so good. Very good. When I started listening to podcasts, there was no podcast about shipping. So that's why I had to start one myself. Yeah. And the, the power that you you wield in doing that, I mean, you can confront some, you can be that change. You are that change agent. I hope I am. Not a lot of people understand it. Just the people who downloads this every month, which are about seven and a half thousand people. <laughs> mm, yeah, it's a great start. Yeah, it's a great start. And uh, I just remind myself every time, where would I be gathering seven and a half thousand? thousand people if they came to see me all at once <laughs> yeah that's a, that, that's another question so what are what are the biggest changes that you have seen during your career in the maritime industry i think the biggest change that i saw was the last ship that i was on there was a transgender individual who had just completed his crossover journey and he wanted to confront the crew and just tell it like it is. I tell him that he he wanted to be identified as a man, and that he you know he had just got his paperwork back from the Coast Guard, and he was really he was really proud of it. And he came to my office, told me this, and I said, "Okay, let's do it." Got the crew together. <laughs> I called the office, and they're like, "They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, let, let me call, let me call the office, let me call HR." I was like, "I promise you, there's nothing in the HR playbook for this." <laughs> Just let me do this. Like, this is, this is what I do. This is what you, you pay me to be captain for. So we did it. And the gentleman said, uh, you know, Cap, can you, can you uh, introduce me and, the, and, and, and share what's going on? I said, yeah, sure. I'll say it all. And you could stand right by me. But what's that going to do for you? How is that going to empower you to tell your story? I said, or I can introduce you, say so-and-so has something to say, stand right by you. And you can tell your story yourself. He goes, that sounds pretty good. So he did it. And I mean, it was a pretty, it was a pretty diverse crew. And people may have had their, their beliefs, you know, that they didn't share the, of how they really felt on the inside. But what that gentleman received was nothing short of like amazing support, positivity, and uh, curiosity. Like, people that I didn't think were going to ask some of the questions that they did, they did. I did. I said. I just sat back and I observed. I was like, "Holy cow!" Like, we kind of took a step. And I grew up. I grew up in New Jersey on the beach. I had four people of color in my school. You know, in my high school. And here I am now, like, introducing a, tra- a transgender person who just completed their transformation. Like, that's it's awesome. <laughs> so I think it, maybe it was as much of a moment for me as it was for him. But um, yeah, just to see that see that level of, and this was like, this was right as the pandemic was starting. I think to see that level of, of understanding and inclusivity, not diversity, but inclusivity is, is a big transformation for, for the industry. Cause there's a difference between diversity is getting invited to the dinner party. Inclusion is getting a seat at the table. 
And that gentleman got a seat at the table that day. Yeah, I think that's I think that's been the biggest to answer your question. How do you think we should recruit the next generation? I've always been a fan of uh of doing like the blind recruiting. How how can you how can you relay yourself on on paper or maybe even a, a blind interview? You know, you read the person, you understand you read the resume, you understand where the, where they've been, what they've done, what they've accomplished. And then have an interview where you can't see that person. I think it'll be super interesting, especially for I won't I won't name the the, the segments of the industry, but certain facets of the industry that would be super interesting for. <laughs> yeah, but but I'm thinking about the branding and our industry. Yeah, I know. I mean, we need to know how to communicate with the greater generation, especially if you've read the papers today. How Greta is responding to bullying. I don't know if you've seen that, but no, I haven't. Well, you should afterwards. You should look it up. <laughs> it's okay. rather powerful. <laughs> yeah. How do we? How do we? Because I think we need to start using different language, using different um, icons, <laughs> or whatever you call it. We don't need that that anchor, or we don't need that steering wheel. We need new things to show what we are all about. People respond and open up to vulnerability. I found, as I was leading others, that if you can, I mean, first of all, it, it really helps to be able to understand people on an empathetic level or be an empath. Or, that's a huge advantage in that situation. It has its downfalls too. <laughs> but uh, to be able to share a situation that you went through personally and share the fear that you you experienced or the emotions that you felt going through that for the older generations listening to this and if you're having a question on how to deal with the younger generation if you exhume vulnerability in conversation that is gold to the younger generation in terms of my experiences uh, emotional intelligence of yourself, understanding what that is, that's how you become a great listener and a great leader. Because it's two different things. What you're talking about is how you or the company will recruit the younger generation. What I'm thinking is the branding of our industry compared to the Googles and the Facebooks and all of those who are looking for the same people that we are looking for the brightest minds, and so on. And we don't send the same message. If we send a message to a young generation, we say, come work for us. We are the best. Mm, yeah, there's no talk of why. No. Yeah, being able, and even even the, the company, the companies are starting to talk about their why, but it's it all relates back to the company. It's, there's no personal connection. Yeah, the branding of the industry needs to change to that more of a personal experience. I also think it's got to do with collaboration that you were talking about before. Because we need to collaborate to to send the same message all over the world. And I think yeah. the people in the industry are so passionate that once we find out what we want to send, everyone wants to help out to do that. Yeah. And there is a momentum now when we have had... The crew change crisis. We have had all of these things that was on the front page. Everything bad again, ever given and all of that. So everyone had to explain to the people at the highest level what a seafarer does, how important the shipping industry is. And before they are changed for some other ones, before everyone is elected somewhere else, <laughs> We should take advantage of this and send a message together. This is how cool we are. And this is the place to be for the young people. Yep. I had a conversation with, um, he happened to be, happened to be a, a man of great means from the, uh, the UK. And I showed him marinetraffic.com and how many ships there were. He had no idea. No idea. Like when you talk about the global supply chain, that is the maritime industry. Ninety percent of the goods moved on planet Earth are via ship. That to me says a mountain of things. Yeah. 
from it's the lifeblood of of the global economy to there is an insane amount of information that is just flowing as those ships are moving. Mm. Still to this day, I mean, I, I know here in the states, Forbes got a hold of the uh, the return on investment for the maritime schools, and they broadcast it over the country, and all of a sudden tuition shot up. And but still, that not many people know about the Merchant Marine, and then and you explain a little bit about it, and they're like, "Oh yeah, my uncle does that." I'm like, "What?" <laughs> How'd you go from not knowing what the Merchant Marine was to your uncle does that? There's always somebody that 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 they know, you know, but it, it doesn't click. Yeah, coming together and getting getting different industries involved in in the Merchant Marine uh, within their ecosystem to collaborate on things. That's I think that's the gateway, mm-hmm. and I, and I I believe I believe blockchain is that conduit because then everybody benefits. Mm-hmm. You know, the the answer to decarbonization probably doesn't lie in the maritime industry. No, might lie in some trucker that's that's driving across the country right now. True, but are we willing to listen to someone else? Mm. That's the key, and that's uh, I know personally that is something that I've I put more focus on listening than listening to understand, not to reply. Mm-hmm. That's what I have learned as well to listen to people because it's also what is not said that is interesting. Mm -hmm. Who do you think I should interview the next? Who would you be curious to listen to? Uh, I'd want to hear the trade done story. Thank you for taking the time, Matthew. I think we dealt with a few things here that we need to think about. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Matthew. I think we need to work together to break that glass ceiling. Lately, I've been deep diving into battery-driven transport. Mostly passenger boats, but also cars and lorries. Pods. It's interesting to listen to these innovators and their visions. I get envious just listening to them. I also briefly visited a labor market fair organized by the Technical University today, and I saw the future. The future when it comes to the next generation. They are much more interested in sustainable ways of transport than many people that I have met during my career in the maritime industry. I will continue to challenge the status quo. And I count on your continuous support. Until the next time, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry. 